Welcome back to the Collins channel. We are grateful to be on your screen after a long time. Today's video is going to be a very special video and uh, we thank you that has subscribed, those that have um, been there to share the moment of our journey since we started up to now. We really are grateful. Today is going to be a very interesting video and um, it's a video about a testimony that I've always wanted to share. And uh, I'm here with my husband, my lovely husband, and our little baby. Yes, uh, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, our video today is going to be a testimony. And it's a testimony about this beautiful baby that I'm holding. This beautiful baby that I'm holding right here. Of course, you can see he's having a beehive of activities going on here. Yes, he's um, hyper. This baby is a miracle baby to us. Um, I remember we we got to know about us conceiving in the month of... of it was the 9th of January. Yes, 9th of January. That is last 2020. year, 2020. Definitely the scans, three of them. Uh, we're approximating either we would get our child in um, late August, if it is, was it late August? Late September, late September or, or early October. Yes. And of course, that is the same period when we got this uh, worldwide pandemic of Corona. <clears throat> and of course, that's the time we started the singing challenge, remember? Yes, we started it in the month of, I think, March. Yeah. And yes. that is what uh, kept us going, mm -hmm. because really our work had to pause for a while because it involves interaction with people and stuff like that. Yeah. So for the entire period March to around, um, what was it August? Yes. Uh, we we focused all our energies in bringing musicians together online to give people hope through gospel music. Mm. Um, of course, we, 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 we knew even if the scans were not 100% correct, it would have a gap of maybe two weeks after or two weeks before. Mm. So the, uh, March goes, May, June, and we were doing our shoots every Wednesday. Wednesday for the singing challenge, the hosting part. It gets to August where we, we had just done our, our first virtual concert and we, we had started season two. Yes. So we had started doing the shoots for season two. And on one, this one Wednesday, I think it was on, on, um, on, on 12th, it yes. must be 12th of August. Mm. We go for the shoot. We finish the shoot um, a bit late in the in the night. It was about seven, and immediately we got done with the shoot. We start going back home. So you don't want us to talk about you. <laughs> so we we get home roughly at about nine. We had supper that day. I can't remember exactly what we ate, but immediately after we had supper, of course, we wanted to do a bit of um, looking at the editing, the videos that we had already shot. Mm. But before we did that, I remember I called a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine. So we were trying to find out how his day was. And immediately we were done with the call. My wife tells me, I think my water has broken. This, remember, is in the night of 12th of, of August. August. We are expecting our baby in uh, September October. late or early October. So this gets us, as in everything, the timing was wrong. <laughs> we were just <laughs> not... in curfew hours. Yeah, remember there is midnight, curfew, which means so. there is no means of transport. Uh, it is midnight. It was past midnight. Yes. And that's the time I, I have never moved in the house without any specific reason moving up and down like that particular day. He was pacing, literally. 
Um, one thing I have not mentioned, uh, when my wife was in her high school days, she got a back problem. And, primary. Uh, primary, sorry. She got a back problem. And according to, how do you call those doctors who deal with bones? Uh, according to the ortho orthopedic surgeon that was dealing with her, he mentioned that your issue is so big that trying to get a baby would be a life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. And she was advised, if you can, please avoid. avoid. So actually, you can tell, by the time we, we, we realized we have a baby, we had a lot of worries. Uh, but, of course, we talk to God, and um, the whole message that we'll be giving in this video is to show the power that God has. It is beyond what science can bring. So, that night, that very night, if you remember, babe, uh, I had depleted my funds, I mean, the one I had as in cash. And the only way to get money was if I had to go to the bank and withdraw. It is 12 in the night, curfew time. There is no means of transport. My wife has told me she has broken her waters. How was my reaction that time? <laughs> he, he passed, you passed around the room. Mm. He told me, are you sure? Are you serious? When is the date today? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I called a friend of mine. Um whom we stay in the same estate, actually a mother to one of my students mm -hmm. who I really want to thank for uh, coming in handy at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And she agreed to take us to the hospital. So we go to the hospital where our insurance cover is. And the moment we get there, we meet a midwife who was on duty. And the first thing, of course, she wanted to see was the book. How do you call that book? Um... Antinental, Antinental, yes, the Antinental yes. Book. So the book that has the report of the scans um, and uh, the progress of the expectant mother. So we give it to her. Of course, she looks at the scan and the scan is talking about late September or early October. And I believe in her mind she had already started drooling out that this is false labor. So she takes my wife for examination and when she comes back she tells us I don't think you people saw what you're, you're talking about. Probably it was urine. It was urine. Um, it was, it was I, I already had a bias about this lady. She had painted long nails. It was just uh, it was not a good experience being uh, our first time as parents expectant parents it was, it was a sad affair. I can't forget that day. So we decide, um, why don't we look for a second opinion? And we went to a hospital which was, was just close by. So we go there. The doctor uh, talked to my wife, of course. And after the doctor talking to my wife, she, she mentioned, now that you already did the examination that uh, would check about the progress of the baby. We can't do it unless it's, if it's after four hours. Mm -hmm. So they did a blood test and what was, what did they tell us? There was blood in urine and I think, I think that's, that's all they so said. So she, she mentioned that we should come the next day and after we come the next day, we, we will do a scan and at least get to know um, if there's anything to be worried about. So we, we came home at about three in the night. And uh, I can tell you I've not had a long night like that one. My wife was in pain. Five minutes, she's in deep pain. She's holding her back, her stomach. And then 10 more minutes, we are fine. We are making stories. And five more minutes, she's in serious pain. Like, you can't believe it. Um, and that's how our night lasted. The entire night, we didn't sleep at all. So that was Wednesday night. So comes uh, Thursday morning and there is no change. There is pain at um, equal intervals. And we decided, let's go to the hospital. Let's do the scan so that we can be able to tell, is everything right with our baby? 
So we went and did the scan and taking to the doctor for the doctor to look at the scan, the doctor told us, I think your baby is almost here. What we need to do, let's uh, stay with you and try to try to assess or monitor the situation so that we can tell if we can release you or not. Remember, this was the second hospital that went to um, that the previous night. I went on and asked the doctor who was dealing with us what would be the financial repercussion of her being admitted here and if, in any case, she delivers in your hospital. And the amount they told me at that particular time, uh, considering we were not working, scared us, so we decided to go back to where we had our insurance cover. But luckily enough, since it was during day, we met a different, uh, very calm, understanding midwife on duty. And when the midwife checked my wife, she said, the baby is coming, and not tomorrow, but today, any time from now. But they advised us that because um, the baby is a premature, we don't have the facilities of handling such a case. We want to refer you to the Provincial General Hospital, and that is a, a hospital level five in Nakuru. So I called my mom, and calling my mom, uh, I tried to bring this news in the best way possible, uh, that your daughter is about to deliver and we've been referred to uh, PGH level five. Oh, my friend, I can tell you, my mom left everything she was doing that time. She was cooking, I'm told the food got burnt. I sent her to pick some things for me. She even forgot what I sent her for. She found herself in the hospital that we were initially, not remembering the hospital I was talking about. So finally she came and we met at the gate of uh, level five hospital. Uh, we got to uh, get admission to the hospital, but unfortunately, due to COVID protocols, I could not be allowed to get inside past the gate. So my wife had to do the admission process by herself and trying to take her things to her room by herself. And yeah, after she had packed everything in, in her room, she came, we bid goodbye, and the only way we were communicating was through phone. So this is about 6 uh, p.m. on Thursday, and I go home. So we talk on phone. As time passed, my wife told me that the pain is keeping on increasing, but we, we kept on communicating. At least it kept me moving. I was just sitting in my office chair where I normally do my editing work. There was no sleep at all. I've not had a night that I am, I am not getting sleep like that one. Uh, it actually felt like I was also part of the labor pains. We we kept on, uh, of course, uh, conversing on phone. But uh, at about uh, midnight or some few minutes to midnight, her phone went, uh, her battery went down, and I could no longer reach her. And this is where I would like her to pick up this testimony from and tell us what uh, went on from there. So it is around midnight, my phone goes off, I'm in a lot of pain, I cannot talk to my husband. You know when you have that reassurance from somebody you love, it keeps you pushing even when there is pain. Here I am, there is nobody on the other end or I cannot access my husband. And um, I, I decided to tell myself now it's me and God alone in this battle, but I knew definitely that he was there praying for me and most likely he, he couldn't get sleep. So um, I, I pressed on, I tried moving around the wards, but I could not do so as uh, I had previously been doing. So I, I, because they had given us partitions where to sleep, um, at about that time, they came and told us, you guys need to sleep. Like They switched off the lights and they told us, it is time to sleep. Uh, get on the beds and sleep. So I'm thinking in my mind, how do I even sleep with this pain? But uh, definitely I had to tarry along 
and I tried to lie on bed and you would close only like your eyes for like a minute and there is a contraction. It was terrible. It was it was hard. So uh, I tried to to conceal the pain within me and okay, there are ladies that always uh, make noise and scream at the words and definitely it is pain. And being a midwife that I am, I definitely knew this was bound to happen because I've seen ladies go through the same. And I was only hoping that uh, my time reaches as fast as possible. So um, at about that time, um, at about uh, like 45 minutes later, the pain became too much and it was long standing. I couldn't even I couldn't even sit, I couldn't even sleep. That restless the, the restless state that is the, the state I was in. So um I tried to call for help from uh, the midwives that were on duty that night. I called and um being that I was speaking in English because by then I don't know, I Kiswahili wasn't coming to my mouth. Seriously speaking, I could I could not phrase the words in Kiswahili and become fluent for me to get the help that I needed. So I tried and called for help from the nurses, from the midwives, and apparently there was none at that time. So uh, about uh, at about one twenty, my pain had really increased. The contractions were really one on one, like they would come more frequently than ever. So I, I I decided to scream out, and the ladies decided to go, and the ladies that were also in labor decided to go and help me call the midwives. Uh, after a long struggle, they got one who came and said she would love to do an exam on me. And, uh, okay, there is a lot that happened during that time that I felt wasn't uh, a good experience for any first time mother because right from experience as a midwife a lady is checked upon every every one hour every 30 minutes whenever they are in labor but none of that was done for me this lady comes in at around one and uh, she wants um, me to get on bed so that she can do an examination so when i got on bed she performed the examination and uh, told me what is happening is that you, your waters are bulging and um, we call it membranes in, in, in the medical term. Your membranes are bulging, but they are not yet broken. So what I'll do, I'll just do the artificial membrane breakage and then augment the labor. Basically, that is what she was going to do. So um, I said, that's fine. And then she... She broke my waters, she broke my membranes. So she told me, your baby is soon coming. So what you do, pick your stuff, pick your bags, and let's go to the delivery room. At that moment, ladies that have gone through that kind of situation, you are not able to do anything by your own. But then uh, I knew that now this is the time. I am here alone, and definitely I have to dance to the tunes of the people that... I have found here. So I went to the delivery room. I told her, first of all, I cannot get off this bed. So you just help me. And then she gave me her arm. Ah, shikilia hapa. Utoke kwa kitanda. So I held her hand, meaning just hold my hand, get off the bed. So I held her hand, got off the bed. And I told her I cannot carry these things by my own. So she told me to give her the basin, and then I had to carry my bag and uh, yeah, my bag and I think some few paper bags that I had that had the stuff that I had taken to hospital with me. So I reached the delivery room, and um, we are only two ladies in the room. So I'm decide. Uh, she tells me to go on a, a, a particular bed in the delivery room. And then I'm like, I cannot get on the on the bed by myself. She's like, no, you have to be a strong woman. Panda kitanda. So I'm like, okay. In my heart, I'm like, yeah, this is a time that you need the savior. 
So I go on the bed and uh, I before I even actually lay, lay down on the bed, I had a contraction. So you can imagine yourself, one leg is up, one leg is down, you have a contraction, there is nobody. And I realized later that I was actually talking to myself, this lady had disappeared. So... Um, after the contraction came down, definitely, I found my way to get on the bed by myself, but still couldn't get to the right posture or to the right position where I was required to be in the middle of the bed, considering the safety of the child if born. So uh, she told me, do not push. If you push that baby, uh, you, will, you will kill the baby. Just breathe. So I'm thinking in my mind, I've always been breathing. So she tells me, uh, just keep on breathing and uh, get on the bed. So I stay there. I try as much as possible to, pre to prevent myself from uh, pushing this baby because honestly, the urge was there to push. And I knew that the more I concealed the urge, the lesser my chances of uh, making the baby survive where so i tried as much as possible to follow the instructions of the midwife because i did not want to uh, deliver without any help but then at the same time i also did not want to be the reason as to why i lose my first baby so this time i'm all in this room with another lady that is also in labor and i am trying to hold myself up to see that I have a safe delivery, and um, it was one, it became two. Remember, I do not have a phone that is functional so that I can, I can, you know, communicate or something. But then I asked this lady, what is the time? And then she's telling me, okay, obviously she couldn't talk because she was also equally in pain. She told me she doesn't know. So later, obviously with a lot of pain, I, I tried. I told God, God, this is the time that I need you more than ever. If there has been a time, this is the time. And I, I was singing. I remember singing songs I don't even remember. Like, I could just mumble out words in, in song format because of the pain. So at around, I, I assume it was around 240 the urge to push was too much. The baby could not wait any longer because I had tried always to, you know, prevent this baby from coming, even when I felt the baby is almost being born. So I cried and shouted for help and nobody was coming. I called and called for close to 20 minutes and nobody was coming. So I decided, God, we were in this together from the start, even up to now, and I'm not going to kill this baby as I see I'm going to push. What you can do, sustain his life. If I'll go, it is fine, but just keep this baby safe. That is a prayer I honestly made. At that moment, my life was not making sense. My baby's life was the one that was making sense. And I told God, I came here when I was okay. I came here expecting a baby. So if it is a baby I'm expecting, let it be that I'll get out of this place with a baby. And if I won't, let the baby get out. And uh, I called, called, and called, and called, and there was nobody to come. So I decided to push. The baby's head was out, <laughs> and I still shouted for help. Nobody was coming. Ladies were bypassing and uh, saying, the baby is here, there's no midwife. I expected them to go and call, but maybe they did their best, and they could not find any. So... Um, after a long struggle, I, I pushed the baby and the baby was out, finally. I thanked God, but the baby is out and the baby is not crying. She's not, he's not showing any signs of life. I cannot see the baby at that moment. The baby is in that. The baby is in the cold. I was puzzled. I just told God, just show me a sign of life. And uh, I continued calling for help. I did not give up. So after like 20, 15 to 20 minutes after the baby was already down, not breathing, not crying, a midwife shows up and tells me, Umesukuma mapema, you have pushed this baby when it is very early. And in my heart I was thinking, there is no way a baby can come out when it is not yet their time. 
but all I could say at that moment was, God, just let my baby live. You have proven that I am alive after this moment. Just let this baby live. To cut the long story short, this midwife uh, took the baby, showed me and told me, is this a boy or a girl? I told her a boy. And then she, told, she took the baby and tried to stimulate him to breathe. And she was telling me, oh, he got kaput or something. Those that are in the medical field, you know, those, those terms. So um, I'm like, that's okay. If he can breathe in my heart, if he can breathe, that will be fine. Then God answered my prayer. And all this while, trust me, I did not even shed one tear. But the moment I heard my baby sneeze, <laughs> the moment I heard my baby sneeze like this, I don't know where tears came from. I just found myself crying. So uh, they take the baby to the table. They do some resuscitation. And uh, he's put to the warmer. And the midwife comes back to me. And uh, obviously, I had gotten tears, a very bad one. So I had to be sutured. And he was a, she was a rude lady. Um, God forgive me, I did not mean to be that, but that is exactly what was happening that time. She was very rude, do not touch me, even when I was not intending to touch. Those that have undergone such situations where you have to be sutured, even when you're given lignocaine of which sort, it is still painful. So um, um, to cut the long story short, she sutured me, told me, take off your stuff, go and shower. I took off my stuff, went, uh, as I, I couldn't even remember where the shower rooms were, but I went, put my basin, uh, took a shower, and then came back. Uh, during the shower, I could hear my baby cry. He was crying very loudly, like the whole ward was silenced by the cry my baby was giving. And all this time, I was saying, thank you, God. And trust me, at that moment, I was not feeling about the experience that had gone by. And I was just very happy that this baby is here, finally. Even after being um, told by the orthopedic surgeon that I wouldn't make it to have a baby, I can finally hear my baby cry. And it, 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 couldn't, it couldn't stop amusing me. I, I got emotional. And then I picked my baby, went to the, uh, the postnatal ward where I was supposed to go with the baby and started breastfeeding the baby. And uh, I think by that time, there's nobody definitely who knew that I had given birth. So because my phone had died the following morning, I think it was around six, seven, it was coming to seven when I got some lady who helped me with the charger. I put my phone on power. And the first call I received was my mother-in-law's call. No, I actually received my, my father's call first because I had told him I am going to hospital. I expect a baby. And then he told me, I'm like, yeah, I delivered a baby boy. And then um, next I received my mother-in-law's call and she was overjoyed. She told me she's actually outside the ward waiting for them to open for her. And uh, when she came in, she was very excited. She, we took photos of the baby and uh, yeah, she posted. So my husband can tell you from there. So by the time I had left the hospital, the previous night we had agreed with my mom that I would be at the hospital early in the morning during the visitation hours, that at least we get to know uh, of how my wife was doing. I was awake the whole night. The time her phone went off, it was, it, be, it, it even became worse. I was on tension, panic, my stomach was aching. <laughs> you got labor you know. pains in short. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I, I literally didn't sleep. And then I don't know how, 5.30 in the morning, some wind just passed you know and i dozed off <laughs> apparently i dozed off and only i only woke up to realize it is 6 45. so i start coming to the hospital and then the gates were closed i could not be allowed in i've started receiving calls hey you have a beautiful baby congratulations and of course, I could not start saying, oh, I've not seen my baby. I could just say, thank you, thank you, we thank God. 
thank you we thank god and uh, yeah so that that was it we were we were uh, how do you call that discharged, discharged the same day at about 1 because one is when i was able to see them and that experience of having i remember you well held my my hand Your it was hand, it was yeah. just heavenly and the main reason why we have done this video which is quite emotional to us and personal is to give hope to someone out there that god is still in the business of doing miracles and miracles do not just come in a way of you becoming a billionaire overnight sure. for a person who was considered not being able to give birth and here god has revealed himself that he has given us a baby even without the help of those medical professionals we want to tell you that do not lose hope um keep up the faith god is still faithful when we say that great is thy faithfulness indeed god is faithful and is in the business of making lives better for his people just claim his name in any situation that you are in and he will come through for you just like he has done it for us may god bless you and we hope that this video will serve as a way to motivate you out there god bless you and until next time thank you for watching us